excited about who you are. Get excited about who you worship. Get excited about who you worship. Yes. Christ. You know what? You are victims in Christ. You are not the down and out. You are not the downcast. You are the victors. You are the ones that have the blessing. You know, Christians have a tendency to walk around. You know what? If you walk around doing this all the time, you, you know what? The only thing you're going to get is to know your shoes real well. <laughs> God said, I am the lifter of your head. Yes. yes. I am the lifter of your head. Oh. I am the author and finisher of your yes. faith. Come on now. Come on. He is the one I yes. you for. So when you walk out of here, I want you to walk out of here not looking inward and downward. Oh, come on now. Upward and outward. Amen. Looking up to the God that saved you. Yes. Because you got to realize, you got to realize what you've been saved to. And we all know we get to walk this journey and we get to go to heaven. Amen. That's our destination. All you know, right. you know when, when I leave this earthly body and I change my address, it's only going to be a change of address. I don't have to put it in at the post office. I'm going to heaven. All right. Amen. Come on. Who's going to join me? Come on. Right here. Okay. That's what we're saved to. Paradise. Now you've got to realize what you have been saved from. Mm. Yeah. And then you have to be grateful. Yeah. You know, I have known Philbert and Gina for yeah, 25, 30 years. Yeah. I remember I remember them as very young people. Yeah. Very faithful. Always seeking. Always seeking to, to serve. But running from God. <laughs> yes, oh yes, no, one foot in, one foot out. You know, we've all done that. We all do that, that 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 Christian world shuffle, one foot in the world, one foot over here. You know, we tend to go back. They call it backsliding. You know, we go back to who we were, we go back to doing what we used to do. And we put one foot in the world, one foot in the, and, and we try to live that way. But you know, that gap gets wider as you go. And pretty yeah. soon you're doing this. Amen. Then you're doing this. <laughs> and then you're doing this. And if I do it again, I'm going to split my pants and you, nobody wants to see that. Okay. What you got to understand is you have to make a commitment to God to follow Him. And that's the title of today's message. We must obey God. Yeah. I want to thank Phil Burton, Gina, so much for inviting us here. What a, what a, what a joy to rekindle old relationships. Yes. You know, they never die. You know, don't see them for years. But I walk in and it's like it was yesterday. You know, I'm, and they greet me with love and, and brotherhood. And Jerry, you know, it's it just it's just wonderful to be here. Yeah. But before I get started, I just want to pray over this this place. Heavenly Father, we thank you right now, Lord. We thank you for your Son. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to just come into this place. Fill this place with the Shekinah glory of God that we can feel you, Lord, that we can feel your presence. We thank you for the praise and worship that has been sent up, Father God, ushering us right into the throne room, Lord. I thank you, Father God, that the Holy Spirit, Father, is here dwelling amongst us. And I thank you, Father God, that you inhabit the praises of your people. Yes. So we thank you, Lord, as we praise you this morning. Yes. And Father God, I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, Think through my mind, speak through my lips. Allow no word to be said, Father God, that does not come from you right from the throne room of heaven, Lord. That every word that I speak, Father God, would touch hearts to change lives in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, I thank you this morning. I thank you, Lord, and I give you praise and glory. And I ask that the Holy Spirit just begin to hover over the South Valley. Yes. I pray, Father God, that that Spirit would just hover over the South Valley, Father God. Bringing power into those, Father God, that know you. That they would go out, Father God, and bring them to church, Father God. Compel them, Father God, to come into the house of God. That they would come and hear the message. Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, Father, I thank you. I thank you for Pastor Philbert, Father God, who speaks truth. And, Father God, I thank you that this church, Father God, would just be blessed with many people coming in, Lord. That it would just exponentially grow, Father God, in such a way that people would be saved. And not for the growth of the church, Father God, but for the growth of the spirit of those that would yes. come. That they would come, Father God, hear the word of God. That they would then repent of their sins. Be saved, Father God. And that they, Father God, would continue expanding 
the gospel of Jesus Christ Amen. throughout the South Amen. Valley. I thank you for the power over the South Valley that needs you yes. now, Lord, in Jesus' almighty name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 What an honor. Yeah. He said he was like a kid in a candy store. I'm more excited than a puppy with two tails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, picture that. Go ahead, picture it. You know, you know how a puppy gets excited and the tail just gets going. Picture that puppy with two tails. That's how I feel today. That's how I feel being here. It's just amazing to, to be here. Gilbert and I are probably two of the most or the least people that anybody would ever, ever think that they'd be pastoring churches. You know? We both come from very bad backgrounds, doing stupid things when we were young. How many of you have done the stupid thing in your life? Amen. Okay, come on. Let's get two hands. You know, you, know you know what? God doesn't care how stupid you get. Come on. You can get as stupid as you want, but God's going to forgive you. You know, there's a message. I was blessed to, to go to a uh, conference with Billy Graham before he passed in uh, at Saint, uh, Lake Louise in uh, Canada. There was only 12 of us and Dr. Graham. And I remember him saying, if you want to go out and preach the sermon that I preach, he, all, all he preached was Jesus. All he preached was the cross, salvation. And he said, tell them this. God loves you. And he wants to forgive you. But there's this problem called sin. Mm -hmm. Repent, believe, and be saved. Come to the foot of the cross. I'm glad to see you all here. Because there are many churches today that do not preach Jesus. That do not preach the cross. That do not preach the blood. That do not preach the resurrection. But they preach God's promises and God's love. And these churches are producing weak saints. Mm -hmm. I took it upon myself to listen to some of Gilbert's messages online on the uh, Facebook and YouTube. I'm not really up to date with all that stuff. <laughs> I listened to a few of the messages and what I heard was truth. Amen. I heard him talk about the strategy and the wiles of the evil one of the devil. I heard him tell you that there are things that you have to do. Mm -hmm concerning your life, spiritual growth, spiritual maturity. We have got to grow in Christ. Mm -hmm. So I'm so glad that you're in the church that preaches the truth. Because the truth is that God loves you, and he does love you. But we have got to choose to follow. We must right. obey God. There are consequences that you don't want to have come upon you. Mm -hmm. There's a time that we must change from who we were. The Bible says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yes. And what comes into your mind must then come into your heart. Hide the word of God in your heart. Meditate upon it day and night. Read your Bible. How many of you got Bibles? Raise them up. Raise them up. How many of you got them here in church today? I don't care if it's an iPad. I don't care if it's an iPhone. I don't care if it's any of those things. There you go. Because we can read the Word of God anywhere. Yes. And when you are meditating upon the Word of God, when you have the Word of God hidden in your heart, guess what? The evil one can't come near you. <coughs> because when we're reading the Word of God, you know what? We're submitted to the Word of God. Amen. We walk away from it a lot. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he must flee. Yes. Amen. Everybody likes the, 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 the scripture that says, resist the devil, and he must flee. But it's preceded by the word submit to God. Mm -hmm. We must submit our lives to God. And that is my message today. So let me set the stage for this a little bit. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and go to the fifth chapter of the book of Acts. And hold that place for now because I'm going to be visiting that chapter throughout this message back and forth. This message, if you let it, will impact your life. And how you see your role as a Bible-taught, angel-sought believer in Christ. I want to impart something into you today that you can take and put into your life and put it into your heart that's going to keep you forgiven 
redeemed, victorious, and a follower of Christ, saved, saved from that which we don't want to have in our lives. I want you to leave here today armed with a purpose. Yes. Armed with a purpose. I want you to notice I didn't say not on purpose. <laughs> I said with a purpose. And some of you are going through things in your life right now that cause you pain. Yes. You know, don't know what it is? God does. Let me talk about that just for a minute. Because the pain, the pain that you feel inside of you, at a certain point, I want you to get angry at it. Mm. I don't want this pain in my life anymore. I don't want to feel bad anymore. I don't want to feel down anymore. I don't want to feel weak. I don't want to feel forgotten. I don't want to feel alone. And you're not alone. But once you get angry at that pain, that pain will give you purpose. Come on. That pain will give you purpose to try to get out, to find the escape, to look for it. And he said, I am the way. Yes. Amen? Amen. amen. Give me an amen. It gets lonely. Amen. 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 And that pain will give you purpose. And once you have that purpose put into your heart and you say, I am getting out, I am going to follow Christ. That purpose will give you power. Pain will give you purpose. Purpose will give you power. That's good. And that power comes from heaven above, from Christ Almighty, mm -hmm. through his sacrifice for you. Amen? Amen. Trying to be a committed and a practicing Christian without knowing what Christianity is all about mm -hmm. will always fail. Mm -hmm. You have got to know the Word of God. The book of John starts off almost like the book of Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things that were created were created through Him. Him who? Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the Word. The living Word, the Logos, living Word of God. The Bible you hold in your hands or you have in your electronic device, those are the words of the Word of God. And those are the words that you must have in your heart and meditate upon them day and night. You must at least know something concerning the wealth of truth that is revealed in the Bible. This is the manual. This is the handbook, Amen. the instruction manual. But you must know the truth with enough clarity to be able to state it to others and defend it to others the Apostle Peter told us, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and if anybody asks you why you believe the way you do, be ready to tell them mm -hmm. and to do it in a gentle and respectful way that others may come to believe. Yes. If you believe in Christ and you believe in the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ, it is incumbent upon you to share that truth. Amen. You have been blessed to be a blessing. Mm -hmm. You have been saved to save. We have all been called into the ministry of reconciliation. And we must learn what the Bible has to say about how we live our life. How many of you believe the words of the Word? Of the word? Amen. How many believe in the Bible? How many believe in what it says? Yes. Now we say that we believe. But does your life demonstrate that belief? I'm going to tell you right now. What you believe must determine how you behave. That's good. What you believe must determine how you behave. If you believe it, live it out. Walk it out. Behave in the way that you believe. That's not my message today. Acts 5 says this. There was a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira. They sold some property and bought brought only a part of that money to the church, claiming it was the full price. <coughs> Sapphira and his wife had agreed to this deception. They had talked about it. Peter said, Ananias, Satan has filled your heart. When you claim this was the full price, you are lying to the Holy Spirit. The property was yours to sell or not to sell, as you wished. After selling it, it was yours to decide how much to give how could you do a thing like this? 
They didn't bring what they promised to give. It wasn't the money. It wasn't what they were bringing. They had made a promise to God to give a certain amount. It is better to never make a promise to God than to make a promise and not keep it. Mm -hmm. God has perfect memory. You might make me a promise and I might forget about it next week. I'm kind of, you know, gray hair. Those things kind of move me. Huh. God has perfect memory. And if you make a promise to God, if you say, I'm going to serve you, Lord. I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You are making a promise. You are making a commitment to God. And it is that promise that you must keep to him. This is what this is about here. Mm -hmm. How much could how could you do such a thing like this, Peter told him? He, you weren't lying to us, but to God, Ananias heard those words and fell to the floor dead. Boom. The younger men of the church covered him with a sheet and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife comes in. She didn't have a clue about what had happened prior to her husband. And Peter asked her, Did you sell your land for such and such a price? And she said, Yes, we did. And Peter said, so what were you thinking? How could you and your husband even think of such a thing? You know, as a pastor, sometimes people come in for, for counsel or they come in to talk about something and they said, you know, pastor, I did this thing. My immediate response is, well, what were you thinking? You know, Peter wasn't being angry at Sapphira. He was questioning her motive. He was questioning why she did such a thing. He was doing it with compassion. He loved her as your pastor loves you. And when you come for counsel and he asks, what were you thinking? What he's thinking is, how could you do such a thing? I've taught you. You know better. You read the word. You understood. You made a promise to God. What were you thinking? And Peter was probably in anguish and heartbroken over this conversation he's having with Sapphira because he knew what was coming. And Peter said, what were you thinking? How could you and your husband even think of such a thing, conspiring together to test the spirit of God's ability to know what's going on? God knows what's going on in your life. He knows what's going on in your mind. Yeah. And that's, a, that's a terrible thing to think about. You know? <laughs> Somebody, he's in my head. He's in my thoughts. Just outside that door, he told her, the young men who buried your husband, they will carry you out too. And instantly she fell dead right on the floor. The young men came in and seeing that she was dead, they carried her out and they buried her next to her husband. Now a lot of churches will use that passage of scripture to teach you about tithing. Oh, bring your money in. It's not, that's not the point. Amen. It has nothing to do with that. What it has to do is with your commitment. Yes. Amen. Your commitment to God, the promises you make to God the Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that is within them and all who dwell therein, mm -hmm. he is our God and we are his people mm -hmm. and we are committed to him. As far as I'm concerned, and I believe that this particular passage of scripture is proof that the Bible is divinely inspired. Ionustos, yes. breathed out. From Almighty God. The Bible, Theonustos, for those of you who don't understand what that means, is a Greek word, two parts. Theo means God. Nustos means breathed out, breath, air. This is where we get our term pneumatic tools, you know, the air power tools. Nustos, pneumatic. It was breathed out by God, and it is the true and absolute holy word of God. Mm. We have got to reach a point as Christians where we can say that if the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. No more argument. And when we read the Bible, we have to take out from the Bible and put into ourselves. We take out from the Bible. It's like drawing out water from a well. Living water that we draw out from the well when we read the Word of God. We don't put into the Bible. We don't interpret the Bible. The Bible interprets you. I'm going to say that again because that's, that's, that, 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 you know, that, that's good preaching. Come on now. You don't interpret the Bible. The Bible interprets you. Amen. The Bible tells you to do that. Amen. Mm -hmm. Later on in that uh, text, the disciples were arrested and they were put in jail. 
for teaching the people about Christ. If you read you know, through that, Acts chapter 5, you're going to come to this. And an angel comes and releases them from jail, miraculously, supernaturally. And then gave them a command to return to the temple the next morning and preach Jesus to the people. Now here they are, the disciples are in jail, they're in handcuffs, they're in chains. An angel comes, supernaturally releases them from jail. The doors were never even opened. And they give them the command, go back and do what you were doing. This is what they put them in jail for. They were in jail because they were preaching Christ. And the angel gives them a command, you go back and you preach it again. Now what would you say? Oh, no way. I'm not going back there. They're going to put me back in jail. You know, you want me to go do the, commit the same crime I already committed because it was a crime in that particular time, but at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors Amen. and brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of his life, speaking of Jesus Christ. Did you get it? Yes. They were told what? To go? go. One. To stand? Okay. Two. And speak in the temple about Christ's life. And they overcame the evil one by the blood and by the words of their testimony. Each and every one of you has a testimony. You've been tested and you're here. That's why you're here. That's why you came to Christ because you were going through a test. Okay. You, know, you share that with people. The good news, the gospel of salvation. We are all called into the ministry of reconciliation. There's a call upon your life. And I want you to understand and know that you must grow in that call. Don't be afraid to talk to people when you go to Walmart, you go to any any store, you're standing here, you talk to the cashier. Talk to them about Christ. The pastor that used to pastor the church I'm pastoring, I'm pastoring Lighthouse Family Church in Galveston, Texas now. He told me one day, he said, you know, I walk into Walmart and I just walk up to people, you know, they'll be walking down the aisle and he said, Jesus! <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> and of course they're going to look at you like, who is this? Who is this? What? <laughs> but every now and then you get somebody's attention mm -hmm. and gets to share Christ. Yeah. And if you can bring one into the kingdom, Come on. one into the yes. kingdom, Lord. you have done a mighty work of God. Hallelujah. How many of you want to do a mighty work of God? Yeah. How many of you want to do great things for the Lord? Yeah. He did so much for you. He did so much for me. There are things that we can do for him. Mm -hmm. And what he wants most are going to be souls. And I am Gilbert, Gina, my wife, Jared. Any of you that ever attended Victory Love Fellowship when Pastor Rob Carmen was here, you're still my pastor. Pastor Rob's still my pastor. Yes. He still comes and preaches at our church. We still have fellowship with him. Him and uh, Ginger are just mighty, mighty people of God. Amen. Amen. He's a good friend. Frank Gilbert, a good friend of mine. But he instilled in me and in them these words. Our passion is souls. Our vision is the world. Yes. Come on. Some of you can be sent up. Yes. It was put so much into my heart and so much into my life that I, I, I can do that in my sleep. That's our, that was our motto. And it still is. It remains that because that was the, what was given from heaven. Yes. It is the greatest yes. vision that I have ever heard stated at any church anywhere. Our passion is souls. Our vision is the world. Amen. We must bring souls into the kingdom of God. This is how we expand the kingdom. Exactly. We're not talking about expanding the church and growing the church. No. Amen. We're talking about expanding the kingdom. Yes. Yes. Thy kingdom come. Thy will, will be, be done. done. We want to bring the kingdom here. We want to leave the culture and grab hold of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Not about the culture. It's about the kingdom. It's Amen. about expanding that kingdom. Say it with me. Our passion is souls. Our passion is souls. Our vision is the world. Our vision is the world. Now, I steal that from Pastor Rob. <laughs> but he gave it to me, so it was free, right? Hey, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> and neither, neither we, 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 we accepted that. We believe that is true. I want you to accept that. I want you to believe that. You don't have to have the motto, but have the passion for souls. 
have the passion for souls. You know, I'll tell you why. Because God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Why? Why did he come to die on that cross? So that we would not have to go to damnation. He saved us from that. How can we ignore such a great salvation? How can we ignore such a great salvation and not be grateful and not go out and want the same thing for other people, for your family members? Some of you have family members that are not walking with Christ. Oh, yeah. Some of you have family members that might be attending the church where it's all about entertainment. You know, I'm not going to get down on all of the churches, but let me tell you what. Until we start preaching the truth, the yeah. entire truth of the whole word of God, which means I'm going to step on your toes. Come on. You come to my church, you better wear steel-toed shoes. <laughs> because I'm going to be stepping on toes. I'm going to tell you about sin. Yes. I'm going to tell you about death. Yes. I'm going to tell you about condemnation. Yes. And if you don't like to hear that, there's another church down the road over there where they're going to tell you, God loves you. Come on. God loves you. Come on. And guess what? God loves you. But God is a righteous God. That's right. yes. God is a righteous God, and He said He is coming again to judge the living and the mm -hmm. dead. Come on. We will give account for our lives. That's right. And then He will separate us to the left yeah. and to the right, the yes. goats and the sheep. <laughs> How many times have you been told? How many times have you heard the words that the path to perdition, which means damnation, is wide, and many will find it. And the gate to heaven, the path is narrow, and few will find it. Yeah. Now, I want you to understand this. Heaven is not going to be overpopulated. Okay. <laughs> Number one. Number two, when you get to heaven, if we get to heaven, and we pray to the Lord, and we are forgiven, you're going to get there, and you're going to be surprised as to who's there yeah. and who's not. <laughs> Timothy LaHaye wrote a book, Left Behind. How many of you ever saw the movie or read the, the series? You know, there's, a, there's one book in there where he talks about this associate pastor. He's at the church, and the rapture comes, and boom, everybody gone. I mean, you know, they're just phew, out of there. And that associate pastor is left there with a few people. The pastor was left behind. Because it's all about belief. That's right. It's all about the belief that you have. Do you believe? Mm. You know, when I first started pastoring, I used to ask people, do you believe in Jesus? Let me ask that question. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes. 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 The question I ask now is, do you believe Jesus? Mm. Yes. Do you believe Jesus? Yes. Right. Do you believe what he had to say? Do you believe the examples he set? Do you believe how he lived his life? Do you believe how he tells you to live yours? Yes. Mm. This is what we have to believe. I can ask you if you believe in Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. Well, you've never seen him, you've never heard of him. I mean, it's, it's, it was something to have somehow. I believe that he was the man that he was here. But do I believe that he did something supernatural for me? No. Mm -hmm. Christ is not just a historical figure. He is yeah. God incarnate. Yeah. Yeah. God made man to come to earth to dwell amongst us, to live amongst us, and to save us from that wide, narrow. I always picture this road as, as, as a five-lane freeway, you know, where there's so much traffic just going on, and, and they're in a hurry to get there. And at the end, there's this great big light, you know, neon lights. It's kind of like Vegas, you know, and a big, a big light that says hell. And people are in a hurry to get there. I don't know Good. why. Good. And then down that other road, there's this little light. Hmm. The light of the world. People don't want to go down that path. Mm -hmm. They want to have that freeway. They want to have all the light and all the glitter. Mm -hmm. They want to live a life that is just filled with themselves. You have got to fill your life with Christ. Yes. And Christ alone. Yes. So he said, go stand and speak. This means go stand and speak all the words of Christ, all the words that you get out of the Bible. When you're in prayer, ask the Lord for his word to come into your life, into your heart. When I go to get my Bible and I start to read, there's a passage in, in Psalms uh, 119, verse 18. 
It says, open thou mine eyes, that I might behold the wonders of your law. Amen. You have to go to the Bible with eyes wide open. Yeah, that's right. Good. Ears to hear and understand. Mm -hmm. And it says, be still and know that I am the Lord. Amen. And we to tend to go to prayer. And we bounce these prayers off the wall, off the ceiling. Because really it's just a wish list. Mm -hmm. Oh Lord, I need and I need and I want. And oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes? <laughs> All my friends got one, I must make a man. No, that's not what it's all about. <laughs> It's not about what you want. You come to God in prayer to praise and worship and thank Him for what He has already done yeah. and what He is going to continue to do in your life and for the glorious thing that you have in heaven. We have got to come to God in prayer in such a way that we are grateful and we are praising and we are worshiping in spirit and in truth. We don't come and say, well, Lord, I need this, I need this, I need this. Go, God. Get it done. He says, die to self. He says, give up self and come to the Lord. The apostles were meeting regularly at that point in time at the temple in Solomon's Hall. And they did many miracles among the people. How I many of you remember that? The apostles themselves were doing miracles. Not Christ. Christ did miracles. We know that. But here's Peter and his disciples. And they are made, they're performing all these miracles in the temple. And more and more believers were added to the Lord. Crowds of men and women, the Bible says. Crowds of men and women were being added. They were witnessing this miracle that the apostles were doing. And they came to believe. Sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and on mats. And they just let Peter's shadow fall on them. Peter would just walk by and the shadow would fall on them. And many were healed. And crowds came in from Jerusalem, from the suburbs, bringing the sick and those possessed by demons. And every one of them was healed, the Bible says. There's healing. There's power in the blood. Yes. And we pray for healing, but do we believe? Mm -hmm. And we come to church and we say, Pastor Philbert, would you lay hands on me? I have a problem. I'm sick. I'm going through something. And Pastor Philbert will come and lay hands on you. Or he'll say, Gina, go lay hands on that woman. And they pray for you. But we see them only as Pastor Philbert and Gina. You must see them as messengers of God, bringing the healing to you. Come you on. must believe in your heart that what it is not about them. It is not that he's a pastor. It is not that she's a pastor's wife. Amen. It is that they are the messengers of God being sent for your healing. Yes. Do you believe or do you not believe? You must believe to receive. Mm -hmm. The next morning, that same council reassembled, the one that had just sent Peter and his disciples to, to jail to figure out what they were going to do about these rebels, these disciples of Jesus Christ, this man who went around claiming to be God. You know, to them, that was heresy. That was blasphemy. They were priests. In this case, they were Sadducees. We know of Pharisees and we know of Sadducees. Here were the Sadducees. There was actually some Pharisees with them. So they took them to the prison. They put them in jail. Or they went to go get them from the jail. They had already put them in jail. The angel released them. So they went to the jail to bring them back, to put them on trial again, to see what they were going to do with them. And what did they find? Jail cells that were still locked, but empty. They weren't there. Miraculously, they had been released. Released. And where did they find them? What did the angel tell them? Go, stand, and go teach and preach in the temple again. So they found the prisoners who were not in their cells, in the cells that were still locked, they found them in the temple preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. And they came to them and they said, did we not strictly command you not to teach anymore in the name of Jesus? They told him, don't, don't be talking about that guy. He's not real. He's, he's, he's a blasphemy. He's a rebel. And Peter and the other apostles answered this. They said, yes, yes, you did. You told us that. 
but we ought to obey God rather than man. Yeah. We ought to obey God rather than man. Yeah. And it's really unfortunate that the translators of the Bible took that word, it's a Greek word, dei, D-E-I, in that passage, and they translated it as the word ought. Yeah. Okay. That word day is much stronger than we just ought to obey God. We, have, we all have things we ought to do. <laughs> I ought to take out the trash more often. <laughs> you know, things that we choose not to do. The word means it is necessary. There's a great need to do it because of the necessity and importance of the situation that you find yourself in. The word ought leaves the decision up to me. We ought to obey. And we hear that and we say, well, I got a choice here. Uh, maybe I don't. But when God says it, you now have a requirement to do all things that he has instructed you to do. You have a divine requirement. The word of God, and we must obey God in all things. Disciples were breaking the laws of men. They gave them a law, they gave them a command, do not preach and teach in the name of Jesus Christ in the temple. They went and they broke that law, and the Bible tells us that we are to obey the law of the land. We are to obey the authorities that are placed over us. But when the law of man comes into conflict with the law of God, you must yield and obey the higher law of God. There's times when you're going to come into conflict with, with the authorities and that you must obey God at all times. They tell our children not to pray in church. They tell our children not to bring Bibles to church. They say, don't pray in church. They don't do this, don't do that. Mm -hmm. We don't yield to that. We don't yield to the law of man. We yield only to the law of God. Amen? Amen. You must obey the higher law of God. Do you remember the three children who refused to bow down to the image of Nebuchadnezzar? Mm -hmm. Those three little boys, they threw them in the furnace. Remember that? Yeah. They did not bow down to the law of man. Mm -hmm. How about Daniel who prayed to God after a king had signed a decree, you cannot pray in any other name but mine. Mm -hmm. He made himself God. Daniel did not obey the law of man. He obeyed the law of God. And they were saved. Mm -hmm. God supernaturally used yeah. them. Yeah. And when you obey the law of God, you will be supernaturally used in a way that he wants you to use because he has a call and a purpose for your life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even though we are to submit to the, every ordinance of the law of man, Peter himself here is saying we must obey God rather than man. Mm -hmm. I changed the word ought. Again, mm -hmm. ought gives me a choice. Must <laughs> does not give me a choice. Mm -hmm. Okay? There's abortion laws in our land right now that go totally against and violate the law of God. And a great judgment will come upon America because of it. Now, God's forgiveness is so good. The world has lied to people and said, well, mm -hmm. this is not a human being. This is this fetus thing. It's oh. not a Amen. person. And they said, we can go ahead and get rid of it. And many have fallen prey and victim to that lie. If you are in that situation and that has happened in your life, I want you to understand that God forgives you. Amen. God forgives all Amen. sin. He is a forgiving God. He loves you. And if you repent and you say, Lord, I did a stupid thing, another stupid thing in my life, God forgives you. Amen. And let me tell you something. One of the hardest things for a Christian to do is to forgive himself or herself. We walk around with guilt. We keep that guilt in our life. Even though God has said, you are forgiven. And Jesus died on the cross and said, you are forgiven. You are forgiven by the blood that was shed for the remittance of your sins. They are gone, thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. God's never going to bring him up again. Amen. And if God forgave you, how dare you not forgive yourself? Amen. God loves you and he's forgiven you and he has said. Don't walk around with guilt in your life. 
How can God forgive me? I mean, I gotta tell you something. I told you that Gilbert and I were probably the two least guys you would ever see preaching in the church. I was an atheist before I came to Christ. I'm an alcoholic. I haven't had a drop of alcohol in 26 years. Amen. My, my wife was testimony to that and because of her. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want you all to meet my wife. She fit in. Stand up. Yeah. <laughs> she hates when I do that. <laughs> but Vivian's my rock. She's my partner in life. She's my best friend. I don't know why I'm telling you all this. But I'm telling you this because I want you to understand that everything you have done, every stupid thing you've done, my alcoholism, my atheism, and all the stupid things I did, I, I was a Navy sailor that says it all. <laughs> <laughs> and God's forgiven me. And it took me a long time to understand that even the things I did that I thought were unforgivable are forgivable. Amen. There's nothing in your life that he hasn't forgiven. There's nothing that, that holds you back. You have to walk in victory. You have to take and believe, yeah, believe, and believe, and believe so deep in your heart. We read the Bible, we read the Word of God. And what do we gain? Knowledge. We gain knowledge. We have a lot of head knowledge in here. But that knowledge has got to translate itself and come into your heart. Yes. From the head to the heart. It's about 18 inches. Some people are going to miss heaven by about 18 inches. Because they know the word, but it has never come into their heart. It has never come here. The word comes into your head as knowledge. And you take that knowledge, and then you must apply understanding. Mm -hmm. Understanding is the byproduct of knowledge. You get all the knowledge, and then you have to understand it. You Then you have to take and believe it. And when you believe it, then is when it comes into your heart. From the head to the heart, and then it comes out here. It's like a pipeline. God's word is going to come into your mind, into your heart, and it's going to transform your mind, what you think, how you think. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yes. We've got to change how we think. And then when we change how we think, and that comes into our heart, you know what's going to happen? <laughs> you're going to love God. You're going to love God's people. And the, the knowledge that came, became belief, that became faith, now comes out here as service. Yes. <laughs> It now comes out as service, and you serve an almighty God. You come to serve people. Jesus Christ did not come to be served, but to serve. And we must follow that example. Amen? Amen. The disciples boldly, were boldly declaring that God had raised up Jesus. They were telling the Sadducees, Jesus, who you murdered by hanging him on a tree. They proclaimed the resurrection. And it was the preaching of the resurrected Christ that bothered so much the Sadducees because they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. You know, you have Pharisees, you have Sadducees, you know how I keep them apart in my mind? Mm -hmm. It was sad, you see, that they did not believe in the resurrection. <laughs> the Sadducees, I mean, the Sadducees, <laughs> you see. <laughs> the Pharisees, on the other hand, they did believe, and they were a whole different thing. But in order to understand who the Sadducees were, it was sad. It was a sad thing. They were sad people. Anyway, I'm not going to go on with that. But they had no belief in the resurrection. And the priests accused them of trying to blame them for the crucifixion of Peter, of, of Christ. And Peter answered that, yes, it was you who murdered him and hung him on a tree. Well, we all did that. We're all guilty. Amen? Amen. Our sins. He died for our sins. Then he said, and we are witnesses to these things. Peter and the disciples witnessed all of these things. They were not talking about, well, something I was told, something I believed, something I read in a book. They were eyewitnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey. This is in verse 32. And he said, the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Did you get that? Did you, did, did you get that part, that last part? The Holy Spirit is given to them by Christ who obey Him. We must obey God. 
that comes first. Peter was testifying to the fact that God exalted Jesus in Christ, the pro pro prophesied Messiah, the Yeshua. And I think it's interesting to think, I don't know for sure, to think that Saul of Tarsus, who was later to become the Apostle Paul, might have been sitting in that very council. He was a Pharisee. He belonged to the in crowd of, of the council. So he might have been there. If you receive anything from this message today, to get this, I want you to place this in your heart. It will keep you from destruction. It will keep you from destruction on the day that Christ comes to judge the living and the dead. And you're going to hear your, your own pastor here preach judgment and condemnation. Don't let that offend you. Amen. Because it is not him telling you, that is God telling you that. And we must obey God in all things. And God loves you. You know that. You understand that, right? Amen. Okay. Amen. Yes. I mean, there, there's no question that God's promises to you are yes and amen. Mm -hmm. Everything that He promised you, He promised you life and life more abundantly. Yes. But we must obey Him. There's something that you must do. And as I prayed, I asked the Father, What should I say to your children at Ancient of Days Worship Center? I spent the week in prayer. And to think of what I should say here today. And he gave me a word for your pastors, for Gilbert and Virginia. And I'll speak to you two first. But I want the church to hear what God has for you. God called you a long time ago. Back when you wanted to lead a sports ministry. He called you to feed his sheep. And you obeyed. You went and you fed the homeless. And you've been doing that all along. How many of you know that Philbert loves sports? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Philbert wanted to lead a softball sports ministry that was at the church. Mm -hmm. But his heart was different. God kept telling him, feed my sheep. And he kept saying, no, I want to play softball. <laughs> <laughs> feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. Feed my sheep. Well, he obeyed. And Gina obeyed and led a homeless ministry at the church for a long time. He was preparing them to feed and to lead this flock. To feed them the word of God. You were being prepared. You were being equipped to come and do what you're doing here today. All things work together for the good for those who are in Christ Jesus. And when he has a call upon your life, you are not going to escape the call. And the call has been given to you too. He called you back then. You didn't know it. I didn't know it. He called you and you obeyed. And the word has, God has given for me, for you today is this. I have heard your cry. I know your concern for this church and your desire to see it grow and flourish, to touch people one at a time. I've heard your prayers, and I know your heart for the souls of my sheep. And he says this, Hold still, man of God, woman of God. Do not swerve to the left or to the right. Hold steady, keep the course, continue doing what you are doing. Feed my sheep, and I alone will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against me. He knows what you've been doing. He knows what you've gone through mm -hmm. to get here where you are today. And your efforts are not unnoticed, nor are they in vain. His word is this, do not turn to the left or to the right. You have put your hand to the plow. Now do not look back. Do not swerve to the left or the right. Many are going to come to you and say, pastors, let's go this way. Let's do this. Let's become a seeker-friendly church and do the things that... They want. Do not start looking like the world to attract the world. What attracts the world is the light of the world. Your faithfulness, what God has put in you, the equipping, the training, the hard times that you have gone through to get here. This is the word he has given me for you. Do not swerve to the left or to the right. Do not take your hands off the plow. Mm -hmm. Don't dwell on disappointments. 
but look with hope towards the future, he said. Let the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. If this plan, if this church, or this work is of you, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, it cannot and will not be overthrown. Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. Word of God. For you too. The life and ministry of the Apostle Paul was dominated by one supreme objective, and he said, One thing I do. Say one thing. One thing. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press towards the goal, yes. the high goal of Jesus Christ. That word was for Pastor Gilbert and for Gina. But I hope it ministers to others. Amen. Amen. If you <coughs> succeed in the race of life, you must very deliberately forget what is behind and very deliberately press on towards the goal of the hope that is in Christ. A couple of days ago, I know he's a sports fan, in the NBA, the Houston Rockets were handed a, a spanking by the Golden State Warriors. <laughs> yeah, and Jerry loves that. Okay. Now, disappointing to me because we now live in the Houston area, so I was rooting for the Rockets. Sorry, Jerry. <laughs> But in order for the Rockets to continue playing at that high level where they're at, you know, in the playoffs, you have to, you play hard to get to the playoffs, okay? But you get there, and suddenly you get defeated. Yeah. And what happens? You get sad. You get sad. You let it go down. Mm -hmm. But in order for the Rockets to continue to play at that high level, every member of that team must put that devastating loss behind them and focus on what is ahead. Yes. Next year. We'll get them next year. We'll get, we'll get them warriors next year, Jerry. <laughs> you know? This is how you must live your life. Forgetting what is behind, forgetting the disappointments, forgetting the hard times. Yeah. It is the things that you remember, which we should have forgotten, that cause the most problem in life. Yeah. It's not the things you forget, those things you should have remembered that caused you the trouble. Yes. You know, you, you, there are things you should remember, the Word of God. Amen. That must be in your heart. Because what is going on in your life, you must put behind you. All the troubles, all the pain, everything that you've gone through, all the disappointments, you put them behind you. And for you, the church, I'm going to ask you, if you have not already committed to the vision that your pastors have from God for this church, it's time for you to make that commitment. Mm -hmm. Some of you are saying, yes, yes, pastor. We're involved. But I did not say get involved. Come on. I said get committed. All right. Amen. How many had breakfast this morning? How many had bacon and eggs? <laughs> well, you know, the chicken was involved in your breakfast. Mm -hmm. The pig was committed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you got that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm asking you to make a commitment to this church to help your pastors mm -hmm. because they have made that commitment. Their entire life is here. Everything they do is centered around this church around you. They don't come here just to hear themselves talk. They come because they love you. They come because God has said into their lives, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and love one another. And he has given charge to your pastors to love you and to prepare you and to train you and to equip you. They are not here to do the work of the ministry. Ephesians 4, 11, 4, 12 says this, And God placed in the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now why did God place pastors in the church? Continuing on in that particular scripture, it says, To train and equip the saints at you for the work of the ministry. Mm -hmm. The work of the ministry should be done by the saints of the church. 
Pastor shouldn't have to do everything. That's right. That's right. If you see a need, fill it. Come on. If you see something going on, bring it to their attention. This is your church. Take pride in it. You know? You might say, well, we're small, but God can save through large or through small. Come on. We have Come a mighty, on. mighty God that yes. we save. Yes. And I said, be committed. Love your pastors. Pray for them. Keep them in prayer. Yes. And get excited when they're up here preaching. You know why? It gets lonely up here. <laughs> <laughs> it does. You know, pastors, uh, you know, they, pastors are just up here, and, and, and then when they have, they're preaching really good. I got some good preaching going on. They want to hear an amen. They, they want to see you jump up and down. They want to see you get excited about the word of God. You know? Get committed. Get in. And take your involvement to the next level. Amen? Amen. He said, forget those things that are in the past. And there are certain things we must forget. I'll give you a list of them. Forget your past sins. I don't care what they are. Forgive yourself. If God has forgotten your sins, you must do the same. Otherwise, the memory of them is going to hinder you. And they'll become strongholds in your life. They'll become chains on your heart. Number two, forget your past failures. If the Houston Rockets, they got to forget that one. That was terrible. But if you're constantly dwelling on your failures and you're reviving the memory of them, your peace will be destroyed. Your progress will be halted. You can live a life of woulda, coulda, shoulda. Mm. But you can't cry over spilled milk. Forget about it. Forget about it. You know, you gotta move forward with things. Forget your past successes. Well, this, this one's kind of different, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Dwelling constantly on your past achievements will never bring about or ensure victory in your presence. Good. In yeah. your present time. If you're looking back and say, Well, I did this and I did that, and I was that was great when you know, man, we do this a lot. I was great when I was high school. Man, I played football. <laughs> I was really good. We do that when we go fishing. Man, I went fishing and I caught one this big. And every year it gets bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and we dwell on our past successes, but sometimes you got to get past that because they will not ensure victory in your present. The next day he's going to go fishing and he's not going to catch any of that. <laughs> You can't dwell in your past success. Forget your past pleasures. Ooh, another one that's kind of strange. Now I want you to know that the children of Israel, when they were out in the wilderness, wandering around the, the mountain for 40 years, they failed to do this at a crucial time in their history. During that wilderness experience, they cried out, remembering the abundance of food and water that they had left behind in Egypt. They were slaves, but they were being fed, right? Because they were working. And this led to the mumbling and the grumbling against the God who had saved them and taken them out of bondage. Just a side note here. If people could see the future results of tithing in advance, everyone would be tithing. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. Because there is great reward in this. God said, I will open up the very windows of heaven and bless you. Mm -hmm. Number five, forget your past disappointments. You know, we live in a life of expectation. Yeah. We expect certain things from people. We expect people to treat us in a certain way. And when they fail to do that, and they don't treat us the way we thought that we should be treated, we get filled with unfulfilled expectations. Disappointment. Has anyone ever let you down? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Me too. Have you ever lost a job? Yeah. A lot of money? Promotion. Forget it! <laughs> Just to keep reviving the memory of that experience is going to cause resentment in you. Mm -hmm. And resentment in you is going to eventually cause a root of bitterness in you. Mm -hmm. And it will do you more harm than the person that hurt you caused you in the first place. Mm -hmm. Good. You still with me? Come on. Yeah. You're getting this a little bit. Number six, forget your past blessings. I'm supposed to forget what God blessed me with? No. Okay, understand this. Those past blessings are insufficient for today's needs. That's good. God's blessings are new every morning. Amen. Yes. <laughs> the psalmist wrote this. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. 
He's not telling you to dwell on the ones he already gave you because he gave you every spiritual blessing before the very foundation of the earth. If you don't believe me, read the book of Ephesians. Now, he is saying he wants you to look forward to God's blessings every day. Mm -hmm. Wake up in the morning and take a breath of air. Thank you, Lord, Amen. for the breath in my lungs. Amen. Thank you, Lord, I'm still this side of the dirt. Thank you, Lord, I have another day mm -hmm. to be a blessing to somebody else. Yes. Don't drag yourself out of bed mumbling and grumbling about what happened to you yesterday. Mm -hmm. Forget about it. Move forward. This needs to be said. Forget the sins and failures of others. Okay? Right. Need to be said because it's so easy to remember the shortcomings of other people. We have a tendency to judge other people by their actions and ourselves by our intentions. Mm -hmm. okay? We're never wrong. They're always wrong. It's always their fault. No. Bless them. Pray for them. Repent of your sins. Take responsibility for your actions. If you have been wrong, you must forgive and you must forget. And one of you is going to run up to me and say, but Pastor, I'll forgive, but I can't forget. I'll never forget. Well, you say, I can't. And I say, you can. Because Jesus said that all your sins will be dropped into the sea of forgetfulness. Mm -hmm. I remember a time I was out at sea. I had just bought some really nice shades. I mean, you know, looking good. I had these really nice gray bands. And I was looking over the side of the ship. <laughs> you all know where this is going, right? I'm looking over the side of the ship. The water was very clear. It was a very still day. And those glasses slipped off. Now I keep them really tight. And they just slipped off my face. And they hit the water and they did this. <laughs> slowly sinking into the ocean. And I thought to myself, I'll never see those glasses again. Mm -hmm. That's where your sins went, to the sea of forgetfulness. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. will never be seen again. Mm -hmm. So stop bringing them up. Stop dwelling on them. They have no impact on your life. You have been saved. You have been set free. And he who the sun sets free is free indeed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Free. Preaching, I know. Right. We need to start to forget about the past. This is what he's saying. One thing I do, I forget the past. Was he didn't say one thing I forget. He says one thing I do is forget the past. Okay? So it's not about forgetting one thing. It's about forgetting all of it. It's about getting rid of that stuff. It's really about dying to self. Get the sins and failures of other people. And then he says, and press on towards the high prize. This means press on to perfection. The word per perfect means spiritually mature. It doesn't Amen. mean sinless or faultless. You'll never be sinless, but you can sin less. Amen. Press on to the purpose for what God has called you to. Hmm. Put your hands to the plow and don't look back. You know what happens when you look back and you're plowing? <laughs> you're supposed to be plowing a straight furrow. And if you look back, that furrow is going to be zigzaggy out there. And then the next one you do, you have to follow it to keep it even. And you're going to just keep getting worse and worse and worse every time you look back. Don't stir up old bones in your life. Number three. <laughs> Press on to perfection. Press on to purpose. Press on with passion to win the lost. I've already told you about that. Okay? Mm -hmm. You have to have that passion for souls. Yes. That must be your attitude. Mm -hmm. Live with an urgent need to go and to stand and to speak with others about the good news of Jesus Christ. About his life, his burial, his sacrifice on the cross, the shedding of his blood, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and the fact that he is coming back. Yes. Yes. Jesus is coming back. There is a glorious end for all of us who believe. Christianity is a very simple thing. Reading the Bible is a very simple thing. Hmm. You grab that Bible, you say, well, this is really complicated. Not only that, it's really thick. And then you get to the book of Deuteronomy. <laughs> Numbers. Well, oh, Lord. 
Then you get over here and, and you get to the begets and he's begetting, they're begetting, they're begetting, they're begetting and they're begetting this and begetting that and you have all these names you can't pronounce. You know? And you get yourself all confused and it gets very complicated and you say, this is hard. I'm going to make the Bible easy for you today. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says what? In the beginning. In the beginning, In the beginning what? God. Just end right there. In the beginning, God. If you can believe that, the rest of the Bible is cake. In the beginning, God. God, the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that is within them and all who dwell therein. He created everything. He created you. He knew you before the very foundations of the earth. He has every hair on your head counted. He knows how much hair you have. And with me, it's getting less and less. So you know, <laughs> the math is starting to dwindle. But God created you. Believe this. Mm. Once you believe that, once you have that in your heart, the rest is easy. Because then you know that man failed and God made a pathway back. Amen. He bridged the past to the future on the cross. And if you go to a church that does not preach the cross, if you go to a church that does not preach the blood, if you go to a church that does not preach sin and condemnation, go to another church. Don't go to a church that's going to tell you, well, God loves you, and you come to the, to the altar call, and you get saved, and that's all there is to it. Christianity is a journey. Mm -hmm. It is a journey of learning and of understanding. Mm -hmm. And with all that understanding, you get wisdom. And you take the wisdom, and you put it in your heart, and it comes out in service. Mm -hmm. It comes out in commitment to your church, your pastor, and to God himself. Mm -hmm. Bottom line. We must obey God. Say, I will obey. I will obey. Stand to your feet. Amen. Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, I pray a blessing over this congregation, over everybody under the sound of my voice, Lord, Father God. Impart into their hearts, Lord, the commitment. They have said, I will obey. They have made a promise to you, Lord, Father God. They have made that commitment here today. So, Father God, give them the power through the Holy Spirit to live up to that commitment. To love you with all their heart, power, and might, Father God, and to love one another. To come and serve, Father God, one another. Lord, again, I pray that the Holy Spirit just hover over this South Valley, Father God. This is an area that has great need. And Pastor Philbert, Gina are raising up an army one at a time putting the word of God into them Father God that it will go forth so Father I just pray that this word falls on good soil and that it sprouts seed Father God and through that seed much fruit would come Father yes. Father I thank you for each and every one here today and I give you all all glory and honor in Jesus almighty name Amen and Amen